Welcome, RTO superheroes, to another episode of our podcast. Today we have a special episode where the tables are turned. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Lauren Hollows. Lauren is an educational visionary and a passionate advocate for building better education systems and services. She is the founder of Anywhere Education Services, and she's dedicated to providing quality, compliant, and accessible assessment tools to educators. With a wealth of experience in business coaching, team development, resource development, and RTO compliance, Lauren excels at identifying ways to improve and streamline processes within the educational sector. She is passionate about using education to make a difference, fostering staff engagement, and enhancing business maturity. Lauren is also the driving force behind Learning Lifelines, a not-for-profit organisation aimed at closing the digital divide and providing equal education and economic opportunities. She believes in the transformative power of education. Today, Lauren will be wearing the interviewer's hat and will be asking me about some of the exciting developments and challenges in the vet sector. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hey guys, this is Lauren Hollows, and we are here for part three of our series on the new assessment as part of our roundtable series. Lucky enough to be here with Marie from Compliance Assist and Angela from Vivacity, and we've had some awesome conversations so far. They will be linked somewhere in the YouTube screen, so you can feel free. Please do actually go and click and watch those videos beforehand because there's a lot of stuff that we're probably going to be referring back to when we get into this next topic. And the last thing that you said, Angela, was talking about the interpretation of the regulators. It was something that Marie and I were discussing earlier on today was that, you know, obviously... You know, we were at the last Valve session together. Asqua had a booth there. It was very relational. I, I think you and I mm. had several conversations with so many different representatives from Asqua, which was incredible. And Asqua really has focused on building a much more relational um, mm. approach to regulation, uh, to working with RTOs, to providing a lot more education materials. Um, and yet what we've also seen in the last couple of months is like the Minister of Education coming out consistently referring to dodgy RTOs. Um, you know, there's definitely been a crackdown within the Crypos sector. We're seeing up to 80% uh, visa refusals for specific countries. So there feels like to me in the air, there's quite a big tension of like, an ASQA that really wants to continue to work with RTOs and yet a, a government messaging that is coming across as to like, ASQA needs to have more team, you know, we need to be regulating more aggressively. Um, and it feels like these two things are quite, you know, they're, they're not synergistic in their approaches. So what I hear from government versus what I hear from ASQA who obviously is government, but like my conversations and the messaging between those two are quite different. We're now coming into, we're going to be coming into 2025 with this brand new set of standards. As you've mentioned, Angela, there's a lot of other bits and pieces coming into this situation as well. I'm interested to see what your guys' thoughts are on more broadly, I guess. I mean, assessment has always been the cornerstone of what gets audited, performance assessed. Um, I'm interested to see, like, what what are your thoughts on what approach is going to happen now? And, you know, is ASPA going to kind of be forced into, like, having more teeth? Are we going to see a return to some of those more challenging days? Or, you know, are they going to be able to, you know, persevere and push through? Or is potentially we're going to, you know, see the end of the Labor government and with the return of, like, a Liberal government, hopefully maybe return to... A little bit more of like that, you know, supporting that collegial relationship um, and, you know, pros and cons of that. I'm, I'd be really interested to, to hear your thoughts on that sort of whole environment. Well, um, to start with, uh, ASQA's change was due to regulations, change in the vet regulators' regulations, where they were told 
they have to educate RTOs and they have to be friendly. <laughs> they have to be useful. Um, so uh, thankfully that did come about. Um, so it's in legislation that ASQA have to provide guidance. They have to provide a user guide. They Also what was uh, added to the legislation was that they um, have to provide training as well. So it will be very interesting to see how that will uh, come about and how it will be implemented. So it is a, their responsibility to do a user's guide, which they're going to be writing in the second half of the year. Um, and that's why we're not, it's not being officially released. We, we don't officially have to comply until the 1st of January because ASPO need that time to be able to write uh, the user's guide. So that that is very interesting with well how are we how are ask we're going to change and then well hopefully they don't go back to where they were before because that it was just they were sweeping out all of the good rtos with the bad rtos and and i think you know in any industry sector we're always going to have dodgy providers it, it, it is um it, it doesn't matter whether it's the training industry or any other industry sector but it will be very interesting with how this is going to change with the new fit and proper person requirements. And uh, that will certainly clean out a lot of those dodgy RTOs as well as dodgy consultants as well. So it will be very interesting how that will come about. Um, I haven't, like we're, we're, when we go to audit with a client, we're now filling in fit and proper person forms and um, and what's going to happen with consultants. Are they going to have a ledger of fit and proper person forms from each consultant? Or Like do we have to have everyone in the organisation? Like we've got a team of nine. Does everyone in the organisation need to complete it? Yeah, it will be very interesting to see how it will be audited and I'll also be very interested to see um how what the user guide is going to look like in the future and will there be training so it's in the legislation that they are required to provide training what is that training going to look like and who will be able to access it will uh, consultants be able to access it uh, will it just be exclusive to rtos who knows watch this space what's your thoughts marie Oh, you, you must have a much more effective um, crystal ball than I do. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, I, I, yes, there's a lot of reform going on. I, I think, though, at the end of the day, for me, it's going to come down to resourcing mm -hmm. and, and what resources ASQA is going to have in terms of, um, you know, which, you know, what they can actually do. Um, and, and you know, obviously resourcing is connected to fees, you know, and the fees, you know, whatever. Um, and I, I think that there might be some hardship, you know, coming for RTOs in terms of if the level of balance, if the level of audit picks up, you know, that that's obviously got massive fees connected with it. But I think it's also going to come down to the capability that ASQA has. Mm -hmm. um, so not just the resources and how they choose to use them. Are they going to focus them on, you know, um, you know, this activity, the the capability development activity, or the, you know, or the auditing capability um, activities or whatever? But have they got the capability and the right capability? You know, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of, I don't know conversation around that in the past as to you know and and you know the the um capability of auditors who've not got a training background or you know and and sometimes that's a good thing um and sometimes it's not um or or they have an end you know so so that whole question of capability um i think i think though it's also you know and I'll pay devil's advocate here. I, I think there is still very much a role for ASQA to play in the in in the um weeding out, if you like. And look, I, I don't like the word dodgy, um, it, because I think sometimes there is a fine line between dodgy versus just not really capable. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, poorly, as Angela mentioned, dodgy consultants, poorly can fall. I'm sure yeah. all of us have had people referred to us from another consultant going, oh, these guys are in really big trouble. I'm like, well, literally, that's your job. Like, that's, that's your job, right. down. Why are you sitting into me now? Because you've stuffed the bar, you know. We, we've all 
all been there, yeah. Yeah. But but I actually think that that an RTO just gets led astray. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But but I think there has to be, you know, and we're we're talking in this session, uh, you know, significantly we started off with assessment. And, and, you know, I think I said earlier, this assessment has always been an issue. The principle of assessment haven't really changed. The, you know, the, okay, some units of competency have got a little bit more, you know, defined or prescribed about what assessment has to be or look like. But the, the principles of assessment, the rules of evidence, the actual, you know, um, and there's been a lot of advice and guidance and everything else from the regulator around that, and yet... I don't I, I don't necessarily see that we have as a as a system really you know got on top of that. So it's kind of one of those things, but well, what do you do? You know, at what point do you draw the line and say, you know, say, I'm I'm probably gonna be the most hated person, but at what point do you draw the line and go, you know what, you, you're just not learning? Um you know, I'm sorry, but you know, we, we're gonna take away that license for you at the moment because, you know, you keep going through that red light. Um, and you've How had, many times do we have to change the legislation, the wording, for you to get it? For you to get it. And and so, you know, but maybe that goes back to what is, is, is the wording wrong mm. that, that people can't get it? Are we being too, uh, you know, I, I just wonder at new standards coming um, and, and, I know myself if I ask a question of ASQA, and it's usually because I really don't know the answer. I don't ask it because I'm trying to take up somebody's time. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's, it, I really want to know the answer. And the answer that I get back is C standard such and such or whatever, mm-hmm. I go, as if I haven't been there. <laughs> so sometimes I wonder if, you know, when I'm having a problem with a client, I'll go, is it me? Like, Okay, how can I change my? I, I'm obviously saying the same thing over and over and over, but they're not getting it. Mm. How can I change how I'm communicating, or you know what I'm saying, or whatever, to to get the message across? And so I, I do think there has to come a point in Asqua's life where it's kind of like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm putting a line through that, and you know, how many how many chances do you get? Yeah, um, and and it's that consistency. And maybe that's not favourable, um, you know, yeah. information here. But it's also the consistency between the auditors. So, yeah, exactly. and this is something that we've had yeah. issues with in the past. Is uh, one auditor's interpretation is different yes. from other auditors' interpretation of what should be in the assessment tool and what is rules of evidence and principal assessment. Mm-hmm. Are they being educated? Are the ASCO auditors being educated on that? How are they ensuring consistency? And that's always been my concern. Uh, back in 2019, we did a survey uh, that went out to our mailing list and it was, what is your problem? I'm, I'm redoing the survey now uh, because things have changed. But in 2019, the biggest problem people had was that inconsistency yeah. with auditors and, and ASCO's, um, you know, drawn out process and we seem to be back there again now. Like um, the uh, the amount of people I've spoken to who are still waiting on applications that were submitted for an addition to scope six months ago or more, and they still haven't heard anything from ASQA. Where you were saying, Marie, about resources and it's staff. Do they have the staff, the mm-hmm. capability to be able to, like they don't have the capacity right now to deal with the amount of applications or re-registrations that are in right now. How are they going to cope with the change in legislation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely going to be an interesting space. And, I mean, even, I mean, as you said, going back to 1.3, if where if, if RTOs are expected to test their tools and make adjustments, right? Um, I guess the question is going to be, and I think this is going to be the big challenge for our ask for is, is how do they I like this year? This is their year for testing these new standards, right? Um, how is that testing going? Like you know, there's a couple of different ways that that testing is going to take place. I know that I've put forward a couple of RTOs where we've kind of gone, okay, look, we'll do our re-reg under the new standards and see how we, you know, see how yeah. we um, how we form up. I think that there's very few RTOs that would feel comfortable going into like a process like that. I've also got another RTO who's going to be doing their registration and they put their hand up to say, look, we're happy to go through registration under the new standards and allow, you know, allow ourselves to be the testing dummy. That's all been done in good faith. As I said, 
based off the back of Pasqua, being really open, leaning into that educative role that they had, the presence that they had at Valve, the willingness to be able to talk to to providers and stuff like that. Um, I the, the interesting thing for me is is going to be you've got very you've got a very different language coming out, which is reminiscent of you know, the, the 2017, 2018, you know, times. And yeah. I'm like, I'm willing to put my neck out based on the relationships of the people that I've had interactions with in us for at this point in time. The moment I start to see more of that language coming into the regulatory body itself, it's going like that. I, I'll pull, I'll pull that straight yeah. away because I'll be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, you know, it's it's just going to, I think it's going to be very interesting. Like it's, there's this huge opportunity with these new standards for ASQA to work as an educative body and yeah. take the best parts of these new standards and really run with them to improve quality in the industry. I think it will be really sad if the federal government turns and goes, no, we actually need you to be the bad guy with the teeth, you know, being, mm -hmm. you know, saying Back how many RTOs were shut down this month. I think that's going to kill a lot of that motivation. And that's for me when these standards become, because of their level of prescription, become very problematic. Um, so I think that added, like, you know, if ASPA stays with the attitude that it's got now and the culture that it's got now, I think these will be a great set of standards. I am very wary, having been through many rounds of, like, happy regulator, mad regulator, <laughs> um, you know, that we're going to go into a mad regulator perspective. I'm going to be like, oh, these standards can be really problematic. Mm. We go into bad regulator mode. So. Yeah. And then if you stack on top of that, the fact that um, there's lack of government funding in states at the moment, it's making it very tough on for, on RTOs. Like there are going to be so many changes that are, are afoot um, and uh, RTOs are going to need to adjust to these. ASQA needs to adjust as well. Um, and then, you know, my concern has been, well, are there going to be some RTOs that are just going to go, this is all too hard. We don't have For any sure. funding. I just don't want to do this anymore. And interestingly, the federal government has released their own funding. And I think that, I mean, that, uh, that hasn't happened before, uh, at least not in the way that they've released this funding. Um, and so I look at that and I go, well, is that because they're going to turn around and go, well, if you guys won't harmonize funding, which we've been asking for mm. for 20 years, mm. we're just going to offer the funding ourselves. And that's innately going to harmonize it because guess what? WA, if you don't want to play the game, you're just going to get less money, you know? Uh, and so now instead of, you know, larger RTOs having to deal with, let's say, seven funding models for seven different states, we're going to have to deal with eight different funding models for eight, you know, for the seven seven states and territories and now for federal. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you've got, like, all of the, you know, federal incentives and your assonance, you know, like all of that sort of stuff as well. Uh, but the release of that new federal funding, I think. But where is, is that federal funding going? Is it going to TAFE? Uh, well, you know, again, that is that is a question, but it's it's also interesting that like in that federal funding and in the the smart and skilled, the WA and the Queensland funding that's recently been released, um, you know, they are skilling non-accredited training, they are funding non-accredited training, they are funding mm. micro credentialing, they are funding skill sets. Uh, there's definitely a transition happening back to sort of the shorter, sharper training in addition to, you know, and less away from, you know, full qualifications, you know, three years of this, that and the other. So I think the next two years are actually going to see quite a few different shifts in. It's amazing. You know, Massive. Like the next couple of years, you know, that roller coaster ride that you were talking about, we're going to be doing a couple of loops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and let's see what happens when we come out the other end. Yeah, and, and then again, and for, me, for RTOs, guys, you need to be watching programs like this. You need to be working with consultants. You need to be yeah. preparing. Please don't make an assumption that, you know, oh, it's mostly same for same. You know, look, unless you are like a top-tier RTO who is proactive AF about mm. everything, mm. please don't make an assumption that these are the same standards and you're going to be good. You actually do need to be planning 
You need to be thinking cruising. about training design. You need to be thinking about learner requirements. You know, you need to be rethinking that in context of your assessments, mm -hmm. in, in context of upskilling your staff. Um, you know, I think that Particularly yeah, with the workforce development plan, there's going to be a lot of requirements around that. We've already started rewriting our policies and procedures. We've already started reviewing all of our documents. Like we're not waiting until the st standards are released. We're doing it now. The other thing that I, I deliver a monthly compliance webinar, um, what I'm doing now is I'm saying this is the current standards and this is what's to come. This is what's going to be changing. And then the second half of the year, I'm going to start delivering to the new standards. So, yes, yeah. yeah, so it, it like, you, yes, as you said, you should be subscribing to these sort of podcasts and vodcasts um, and also looking at training and how, like, not just for the standards, we've also got AI and we've got chat GPT. Like there's so many things that are changing. Um, if you guys don't keep up, you're going to fall off the wagon. Spending the money, like spending money and time in advance is just going to save you so much more down the track. Like yeah. spend $10 up front is going to save you having to spend $100 fixing it in the, in the rear end. Um, I know that's something that you know, every consultant that I work with goes, mate, if you just, you know, if you'd spent 10 grand on getting that part right beforehand, you now, I now wouldn't have to be spending, you know, we now wouldn't have to be spending $100, 100000 not just fixing this, but then also going okay. back and working with students and, and, and the reputational damage that that's now going to cause you know, and, and this, that, you know, and the fact that you've got a black mark with the regulator and, you know, everything like that. So use this time, guys, test the new standards. Like you guys test the new standards, test your new policies, you know, work with people like Angela, like Marie, get feedback from them. I know that both of you guys do put out a lot of resources, you know, in the form of, you know, training sessions and workshops and, you know, just so many different ways that you guys can get access to this sort of a knowledge without it costing you an arm and a leg. Um, and then be strategic about those points where you really do need that help, you know? Um, yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Um, just really quick hand over to both of you. Please let us know where we can find you um, and what you've got coming up you know, in the next couple of months that we should be looking out for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn, Angela Connell Richards, and I'd love for you to uh, follow me on there and connect with me because I have a lot of content that I um, share on there. And then the other one, uh, we've got the RTO community. It's a Facebook group that you can join and it's, um, I facilitate it, but it, it's actually got its own mind. It's got this huge community now that is in there. We've got a, a two and a half thousand people in there and there's all these offshoot chats uh, that people have got in there as well. Uh, a lot of, you'll learn a lot and share. There's a lot of sharing that's happening in there, particularly um, in the chats. And then we've got the RTO job board on Facebook as well. So that's another group. That one's got over 5,000 now um, and it's trained and assessors as well as RTO owners that are on there uh, and we're sharing those groups uh, what are the changes that are happening, what's going to affect the trainers and assessors, what's going to affect the RTO. Uh, so I definitely recommend that you get onto those. Um, and then we've got a series of workshops that we're delivering this year, uh, particularly on AI and the new legislation. So you can go to vivacity.com.au and learn more about our events. Excellent. Over to you, Marie. Oh, my goodness. Just listening to Angela's list, I, I'm obviously not doing anything. Um, <laughs> and that is very, um, very comprehensive. Wow. Um, compliancesist.com.au, also on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm sort of at the moment trying to, trying to transition myself away um, a little bit from compliance focused and 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 sort of really try and encourage clients to move into the more um you know the pillars of governance you know um the 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 governance the sustainability and the you know and, and the quality and compliance as a sort of the three pillars so try and take a, a holistic view of an organization because you know we, we sort of 
sort of talked about some stuff in this session, earlier sessions around, you know, some of the costs that may be involved to an RTO. And so one of the things, one of the challenges is trying to look at that RTO and go, you know, balancing that business acumen with the academic rigor with the ethical decision making um and and you know looking at the organ you know I'm, I'm sort of working with a partner we're, we're calling it sort of an organizational needs analysis if you like you know doing doing a lot of that work around looking at the organization the RTO as a whole um you know rather than as disparate and separate parts so that would work well with the workforce development plan um, requirements as well you know, mm. we do the eight critical drivers to rto success which is a master class we deliver once a month and it's all about getting that balance between clients and business success exactly yeah exactly and it's so important i think you know we talk very much about compliance and a lot of the pd it's it really is focused on compliance but you know as an organization you know you can put as much money as you like to it but you'll you'll be out of business in no time so it's finding yeah, it's got to be Sustainable, it's sustainable and financially viable at the end of the day, mm. right? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, guys, thank you very much. Thank this you. has been an awesome series. I really appreciate your time. So I know that you are both very, very busy women. Guys, you can find all of Angela and Harine's contact details, all of their socials and everything like that in the links below. If you have enjoyed this, please do like, subscribe, comment, all of those good things. Otherwise, thank you so much to Angela and Marie. My name is Lauren Hollows for NLI Education Services. Thank you for joining us at the RTO Superhero Podcast with me, Angela Connell Richards. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on your preferred podcast app. Each rating and review helps me fulfill my goal of helping training organisations around Australia to learn and grow in compliance and business success.